So welcome to the sixth Darwin College lecture in the 2013 lecture series, which has foresight as its theme. I mean, at this time of year, of course, we tend to be rather focused on the weather. Will it be warmer tomorrow? Will it snow tonight? Will the sun shine this week? But space weather? Surely that's rather a curious topic for foresight. Or maybe not. Certainly in the early 17th century, with the development of telescopes, observation of the sun was, was possible, and moving sunspots were first observed. The sun was no longer a static body at the center of the universe. Galileo Galilei, whose contributions to science were extraordinary, commented, the sun, with all those planets revolving around it and dependent on it, can still ripen a bunch of grapes as if it had nothing else in the universe to do. Now, the Earth's magnetic field obviously generally protects us from the streams of high energy charged particles also coming from the sun, but not always. The great solar storm of September 1859, if repeated today, would probably knock our global economy flat. Satellites, planes, GPS, all manner of wires were, would be in trouble. I lived in Saskatoon in Canada for many years, and there we often enjoyed extraordinary curtains of color hanging from those miraculous auroral views. Why go to the Arctic when you can just lie out in your back garden on the lawn and watch the show from above? But these, this is the Darwin College lecture series, and I think as Darwinians we can forget that there was a, another very great scientist on the voyage of the Beagle. There was Robert Fitzroy, later Vice Admiral, a remarkable scientist too. Now Gauss had just discovered how to measure the absolute intensity of the magnetic field. On the Beagle, Fitzroy made very advanced three component measurements, helping to lay the modern understanding of the Earth's magnetism. That was one of the beginnings of the chain of discoveries that led to the discovery of seafloor spreading by Fred Vine and Drummond Matthews, and thence to plate tectonics. And my first supervisor, Sir Edward Bullard, Teddy, stood also in this Cambridge line, among his many achievements being insights into the origins of the Earth's magnetic field. But tonight, we're looking to the future. We have Jim Wilde, he's a distinguished solar terrestrial geophysicist from Lancaster University very known, well known for his work on magnetospheric storms. And if you want to know about the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights, when and where to see them, he's the person to ask. So Jim, we look forward to your foreseeing of space weather. Okay then, well good evening everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and, and thank you very much for the, the very warm welcome. Um, so uh, th our story really then is going to begin, um, as we've heard in the introduction, at the sun. Uh, the sun for hundreds of thousands of years when, when uh, total solar eclipses have occurred, people have been treated to a fantastic view of the sun's atmosphere, visible only during the, uh, the total eclipse because uh, the atmosphere uh, will scatter light towards the Earth, but normally light, this light is, is completely swamped by the bright light of the disk itself. So during total solar eclipses, you get this sort of great view, um, and that enables us to get a really good look at what's going on in the environment just around the edge of the sun, around the limb of the sun, where the behavior of the electrically charged gases are dominated by the sun's magnetic field. Um, but actually, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, so I'll, I'll go back to a couple of centuries and we'll talk about something we've just heard about. We'll talk about Galileo, um, a person of great foresight, but, uh, but what we're going to talk about here is Galileo's observations of sunspots. So through his very early telescopes in the 17th century, Galileo was able to make observations of dark surfaces features on the sun. And it was through observing these that it was quickly realized that the sun probably wasn't a flat disk, it was in fact a sphere, and that it was rotating because these objects move across the surface of the sun as if on the surface of a rotating sphere. 
And this is where our story of space weather really begins, because it's solar activity that is going to drive space weather. So what I'm going to try and do is, in the first part of my lecture this evening, talk a little bit about what space weather is, then try and convince you as to why you should care about what space weather is, and then, towards the end, wrap up a little bit about the uh, foresight into where space weather is going and how our society may need to think a little bit more carefully in the future about how to live with a, a next-door neighbour that is a star. So, for hundreds of thousands of years, since uh, people walked, around, walked the surface of the Earth and walked in the Arctic environment, they were treated to beautiful lights of, in, in the night sky, the beautiful lights of the Aurora Borealis. So, the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Dawn, also visible in the Southern Hemisphere, the uh, Aurora Australis, these fantastic curtains of, of, of red and green light in the night sky, captured here by one of the amazing videos of the type you see popping up on the internet all over the place now, H high definition, time-lapse videos of the Aurora Borealis. These are real evidence that we are living within space weather, that there is space weather out beyond the top of our atmosphere, and it is starting to interact with our planet. Uh, so, for a long time, people made up stories about what this might be to give themselves um, some framework in which to understand the natural environment around them. So, you could have been looking at the, the ghosts of the departed in the afterlife, sending messages down to the people on the ground. And all those peoples around the Northern Hemisphere, Arctic Circle, um, and the Antarctic Circle in the Southern Hemisphere, um, although generally populated by penguins and mad scientists, um, they would have come up with legends, stories, belief systems around the natural environment. So space weather is nothing new, it's always been there. So I'm not coming here tonight to tell you this is something new um, in any way at all. So this is our window onto the space weather environment. If you've got nothing more than your two eyes, you can go to certain parts of the world, around the edge of the Arctic Circle typically, and observe space weather happening directly. And why that happens, I'll move on to in a moment. But in the last hundred years or so, we've made enormous advances in understanding this space weather environment. So if we take a look at, for example, uh, the work of Christian Birkeland. Christian Birkeland was a, a Norwegian scientist working at the beginning of the 20th century to try and understand the physics of the Aurora Borealis, the physics of the Northern Lights. And so in the absence of the kind of computational models and simulations that we would perhaps use nowadays, Birkeland built simulations in his laboratory to try and recreate the Northern Lights. And what we have here is a fantastic photograph of Birkeland in his laboratory operating one of his Torella, a machine designed specifically to recreate the Northern Lights. And to just sort of orient you around this laboratory environment, we have uh, a large glass case in the centre, evacuated glass case, and in the centre of that you can just see a spherical orb. It's a metal orb, and inside there is a magnet a bar magnet that basically recreates the Earth's magnetic field with poles coming out, with magnetic field coming out of, of both poles. By evacuating most of the air from this chamber and then passing very high voltages through it, Birkeland was able to see that, that currents would pass down through long magnetic field lines and start to scintillate and ionize the air in the regions around the magnetic poles and create patterns of bright lights. And from this work, he, he extrapolated that the northern lights were something to do with with electrically charged particles moving through the space environment that were being funneled down into the polar regions of the Earth by the Earth's magnetic field. Now, by this point, scientists already knew um, that the Earth's aurora were in some way linked to the sun's activity. So it was obvious from uh, astronomical observations that when the sun was particularly active, in terms of, for example, the number of sunspots you could see or the number of prominences you could see, that you would see geomagnetic activity in the Earth's magnetic field that you could effectively observe with a compass, and that you would see enhanced activity in the, in the northern lights. And so Christian Birkeland was really underpinning these, these well-known well -known phenomena with some fundamental physics. Um, we could argue, since we're talking about foresight, that Christian Birkeland had foresight in that he knew that his device was creating enormous quantities of x-rays. If you go to a hospital x-ray machine, uh, it creates x-rays by funneling very high-energy electrons into a metal target, which is essentially what Birkeland's machine is doing here. But he had the foresight to take precautionary measures and was uh, always seen to be wearing his fez when operating this machinery. <laughs> As he felt it, it protected him from the x-rays. So by the, the first half of the 20th century, there was a picture emerging that the sun was an active environment in which which produced um, gas which was emitted into the environment around it, 
which you could see during a total solar eclipse. There was a, a chain of cause and, cause and effect of measurements, so you could see solar activity linking to geomagnetic activity in the aurora. But there were no in situ measurements of the space environment. We have, of course, we're predating the space age here. And so it wasn't really understood whether space was filled with material from the sun all the time, or if generally space was empty, but occasionally the sun had a, a pickup in its activity and emitted lots of material filling the environment uh, in between the planets. And so this is actually um, a figure from a paper in the early 1930s which uh, explores this idea where the, the sun might, if you imagine, turn on and start emitting gas into space, and sometime later after the material has travelled through the interplanetary environment, it would arrive at the Earth and probably be deflected around the Earth's magnetic field somehow, in some way, which you can see here. So we have a, a front of material moving from the sun, which is off to the left, moving from left to right and, and, and going around the Earth, a bit like a rock in a river. But it was really the beginning of the space age that opened up the, the, the discoveries, uh, opened up the, the taps on the discoveries. And so if we move forward to the end of the 1950s, there's a very famous photograph here of three gentlemen holding up a model rocket. And the chap in the middle is James Van Allen. Um, and James Van Allen was the discoverer of the radiation belts, the Van Allen belts, as they're, they're sometimes known. But they're actually holding aloft a model of Explorer 1. Now, Explorer 1 was the first successful US satellite. This was launched in February 1958. So keep in mind that Sputnik had flown in October of 1957. So although this was a great success, we're looking at the Cold War space race here, and, uh, and the USA are, are not in first place at this time. But the gentleman in the middle, James Van Allen, had tremendous foresight because he actually placed a Geiger counter on the top, on, onto their satellite. So ideally, they were testing technology. They wanted to see if they could build a satellite, and that was the main objective, and also to beat or to catch up with the Russians. But since there was some spare mass available on the launch vehicle and some spare space and power available in the satellite, they were able to put in what was effectively a Geiger counter. Uh, and it turns out that that was transformational in our understanding of the space environment. Since we are talking about foresight, I probably should mention that the gentleman on the right-hand side of the photograph displayed tremendous foresight, and that that is actually Werner von Braun, the father of the German rocket program during the Second World War, who himself had the foresight to, uh, to surrender to the US Army rather than the Russians at the end of the Second World War, <laughs> thus starting his career and effectively put men on the moon um, some 10 years later. But these were tremendous times of discovery. It was very unclear what was in the geospace environment, what was in the space environment around planet Earth. And, and it actually led to this quotation, which is attributed to one of Van Allen's colleagues. He says, my God, space is radioactive, because as soon as they turned on their Geiger counter, wherever the spacecraft was, it started detecting alpha particles and beta particles, and it was detecting energetic protons. So it was detecting lots of what we call radiation, ionizing radiation, throughout space. It wasn't empty. It wasn't a cold, empty vacuum. And this discovery made Van Allen's name. So uh, Van Allen is seen there on the, on the left on the cover of Time magazine. Um, but it basically discovered the radiation belts, the Van Allen belts, two belt-like regions where trapped high-energy particles build up around the Earth, an inner belt of mainly electrons and protons and an outer belt of electrons. So electronically charged subatomic particles at very high energies, in some cases relativistic energies, particles moving at a fraction of the speed of light. So we tend to think of space as being cold and empty, and actually it turns out it's neither of these things. There are quite a few particles out there, uh, and they're not cold by any means. So if we now fast forward to what contemporary space science tells us, um, this is a, an image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So this is NASA's state-of-the-art, high-definition camera system studying the sun. And it studies the sun 24 hours a day, and so we're able to make fantastic um, movies uh, and look at the dynamic features of the sun. And so this is the sun observed um, in ultraviolet, in extreme ultraviolet wavelengths. So these are the wavelengths of light which are corresponding to temperatures well in excess of a million Kelvin. And so we're looking at the... The, the outer surface of the sun and the lower parts of the solar atmosphere. And you can see that the sun is rotating. This is what Galileo would have seen through his telescope when he compared drawings from day after day. We see it now presented as to us in a, in a time-lapse movie. But the sun is rotating about once every 27 days. It actually rotates slightly at slightly different speeds at the equator and the poles. But on average, about once every 27 days, it completes a full rotation 
And so as the first natural effect, if you have a particularly active region on the sun, so you can see in this particular image there are dark, cooler regions and bright, hotter regions, then because the sun is rotating, that will have the effect of almost being like a lighthouse. The, the material spewing out from some of these regions will be form almost a beam, and as the sun sp turns around, that beam will sweep across um, the solar system. And so material will be um, emitted from the sun and can arrive in a variety of directions, uh, or can be sorry, spat out in a variety of directions, and therefore can arrive at planets um, several days later. And so the solar uh, driver of space weather partly comes from the fact that the sun is this very non-uniform sphere. It's a very dynamic animal. It varies greatly in time and, and in space. So some regions are more active than others, and at some times it's more active than at other times. But if we take a slightly different perspective of the sun, this is actually what a solar physicists would call a coronagraph. So we're creating an eclipse here. And this is data taken from the European Space Agency's SOHO mission. And SOHO is a satellite which sits at a gravitational sweet spot, it's the Lagrangian point, which sits between the Earth and the Sun. And it can actually, you can put a spacecraft into orbit around this. And so if you do that, the, the Earth will never get in the way. If you have a spacecraft orbiting the Earth trying to see the Sun, then during your orbit, the Earth gets in the way some of the time. But spacecraft out at the Lagrangian point to have an uninterrupted view. So if you imagine that you'd like to be a European Space Energy spacecraft, you're looking, at the, uh, you're looking at the sun. We have a planet just creeping into the field of view there. It's not a UFO, I promise. Um, and, uh, and so the Earth is over your shoulder. The Earth is somewhere behind you. And so from your, this perspective, if we block out the glare of the sun using, a, frankly, a metal disk, a, a, an obscura, um, we can see the light scattered from the solar wind. So now we can start to see material that normally you'd only see during a total solar eclipse. And you can see that there is material always streaming out from the sun. It's constant. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at an average rate of about a million tons every second. Mainly uh, protons, so these are the, the, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, um, and alpha particles, so the nuclei of helium atoms, which have started off in the solar atmosphere. And they're very hot, and they're speeding out into space. And as they're arriving at the Earth, they're moving at about four or 500 kilometers per second. So they're moving very fast. Um, they're not, the, the, the space is not empty, as I've already mentioned, but uh, it's not very thick either. It's not very full of particles. So just to get our, our heads around the numbers we're talking about, if you took a sugar cube-sized volume of space, um, that's about one cubic centimetre, uh, where this spacecraft is sitting, just upstream of the Earth, then there'll be about one to ten particles in every sugar cube-sized volume. If you do the same trick in this room, the, air, the sugar cube size volume at the end of your nose, there's probably about a billion, billion atmospheric particles in there. So, so compared to the air we're breathing in, the, the, the atmosphere of the Earth, this is a very rarefied environment, but it's by no means empty. And that material is constantly streaming past the Earth and the Earth's magnetic field. And so the Earth's magnetic field is strong enough that we can form a force field, if you like. So most of the material actually is, is, deflect, is, is, is deflected around the Earth, and we live inside a cavity inside the solar wind. So, so the Earth's magnetic field really is like a rock in a river. Most of the solar wind streams around the Earth's magnetic field. But some of the energy leaks across the boundary, and the Earth's magnetic field can actually tap into that energy, and magnetic connection will pull energy from the solar wind. It's kinetic energy, it's momentum. This stuff is moving very fast away from the sun. And it will pull it and store it in magnetic energy, and then it's periodically released explosively in a cycle that lasts every two or three hours. That so goes every two or three hours, capturing and releasing energy into the into the inner part of the uh, geospace environment. And it is a it's a pretty complex system. So if scientists try and simplify it, you get these uh, confusograms. And this is a this is a cartoon of the uh, of, of the magnetosphere in cutaway format. So the sun is actually off to the bottom left of this and is streaming up towards the top right of the image. And, and we've got a cutaway here. Um, and actually, the radiation belts, the Van Allen belts I mentioned earlier, are, are what's color-coded in there in those lovely hot red and, red and yellow colors. Um, and those are, are full of material that has been accelerated by energy effectively leaking in from the solar wind and energizing material trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. And the processes that go on in there are actually still something of a mystery. The, 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 the physics that causes particles to take energy from wave motion to, to just to oscillations of field lines in the magnetosphere due to the buffeting of the solar wind and the magnetic connection to the solar wind, those processes are still not well understood. It's still very difficult to account for how, these, how, the, how the radiation belts fill up with highly energetic radio, um, relativistic particles. 
And of course, the thing to keep in mind here is that we're living inside all of this. We have something which is approaching a totally natural particle accelerator, a, a system which will take particles and extract energy from the solar wind and put them into electrons and protons in the near Earth space environment. And we live directly underneath it all. So at the heart of that system in the Earth, if I go to my second confusogram, we have a massively complex system of electrical currents and magnetic and electric fields which electromagnetically couple the Earth into the environment around us. And sitting embedded in the bottom of this complex system of coupling is the Earth's atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere is coupled into the space environment. The Earth's atmosphere is coupled in electromagnetically to the Sun. And so it's probably no surprise, therefore, that we get this pathway of energy that leaves the Sun behind, travels through interplanetary space, and ultimately dumps energy into the upper atmosphere, causing it to glow. And so if we take a look at the aurora from a slightly different perspective, if you ever get the chance to take a ride on the International Space Station, you should hopefully get a view of it like this. So looking out of the window at the, at the aurora, you can see you have this, the aurora appears to be a thin carpet at the top of the atmosphere. It's actually just the upper layers of the Earth's ionosphere. It's the parts of the upper atmosphere that are ionized. The particles are broken down by ultraviolet radiation from the sun, which makes them electrically conductive because you're freeing electrical charge carriers from atoms. And it's the ionosphere which is, which is glowing here and the neutral atmosphere embedded within it. And we're actually seeing atomic oxygen in the upper atmosphere being bombarded by electrons from the space environment. And the atomic oxygen is excited by collisions with these incoming electrons raining in from the space environment. And these atomic oxygen atoms, uh, these atomic oxygen does not like having um, uh, energy dumped into it through collisions with particles um, joyriding in from the space environment. And so in order to return to a ground, a ground state energy, these particles will dump some light overboard. And with oxygen, the characteristic color you generally get is green, although you can get red as well. And you get the characteristic light of the aurora. So here we see some very high-tech movies of the, of the Northern Lights, which we can contrast to those simple observations that people have been making for hundreds of thousand years with their, with their naked eyes um, from the ground in, in the Arctic region. And scientists such as myself uh, um, have been using instruments uh, in the space environment and on the ground to study this interaction. So if you have, for example, a radar system, and this is a radar system located on Svalbard, uh, in, so on Spitsbergen in the Svalbard archipelago, uh, then you can point your radar and start to look at particles raining in from the upper atmosphere, and you can start to see the temperature and composition of the upper atmosphere and see how the velocity of the upper atmosphere moves in response to the space weather environment above it. You can fly spacecraft in, in Earth orbit around and through the radiation belts, through the auroral acceleration regions of the firing material inwards, you can, fly them through the, you can fly them through the Earth's magnetic tail and through the boundaries of the magnetopause going into the solar wind to basically taste the solar wind as it's arriving from the sun. And you can use remotely sensed observations bordering on astronomy, so solar physicists um, would use telescopes to study the, the sun with remote sensing techniques. And so we're able to combine these measurements looking from afar and actually embedding sensors within the solar wind and the magnetosphere and the ionosphere in order to try and unpick the physics of this, of this environment. And so we're now at the point where the science has reached a maturity that um, such august bodies as the World Meteorological Organization now define space weather um, as, a, as, a, as a recognized um, a field. And so here we have the World Meteorological Organization's definition of space weather. So space weather encompasses the conditions and processes occurring in space, including on the sun, in the magnetosphere, ionosphere, and thermosphere, which have the potential to affect the near-Earth environment. And so space weather is just a nice, catchy way of saying um, the solar activity that affects the Earth and the Earth's environment. Now, space weather, in many respects, is rather like the weather we've been thinking about already tonight, in that we want to be able to forecast it for a variety of reasons, but it also has seasons, just like the, weather, the regular weather. And so um, one of the ways of thinking about the seasons of space weather is to think about sunspots. So sunspots emerge through increased solar activity. And so they actually are, they are the, the markers, they are a proxy for the level of solar activity. And if you just count the number of sunspots you can see at any one time and keep a running record over several hundred years, which is what we have here, then you can immediately start to see that the number of sunspots you see varies with about an 11-year um, cycle. 
So every 11 years or so, the number of sunspots you see reaches a peak, and then it declines, reaches a minimum, and then will rise to a peak again. Um, and this is actually betraying a 22-year cycle in the sun, in that through one of these cycles, um, one of the 11-year cycles, the number of sunspots rises and then falls. As it falls, the sun's magnetic field reverses in polarity, and the next, half of the next cycle of spots, it goes, rises and falls again, and then the sun's field will reverse polarity again. So actually, truly, solar cycles are 22 years, but we usually think of, or talk about them in terms of 11 years because that's the, the sunspot cycle. And you can see there are seasons then, in the same way you have winter to summer to winter, we have solar minimum to solar maximum to solar minimum, which we, where we basically could either think in terms of sunspot number or just use that as a proxy for, for activity. There are longer term trends as well, so you can see from this chart as well that the, the height of the sunspot maximum, the number of spots you can see, isn't the same in every cycle, it isn't the same at every maximum. So there's almost a sort of sunspot climatology here where you can start to look at longer term trends in solar activity. Um, and so, you'll probably be thinking, where are we now, if you look at this? Well, we're somewhere towards the bottom. I've deliberately left the current solar cycle off. But, but if you look at this, this cycle, you can quickly work out that there was the last peak was at about 2,000 and something. And if it's an 11-year cycle, then we're probably at about the next peak now. Um, and if you hadn't just worked that out from, from that slide, then you may have worked it out, depending on which newspaper or news channel you listen to, um, so in the last few years, there has been quite a growing interest in space weather and what impact that will have on life here on Earth, particularly humans and their, their high-tech civilization. So um, I've just got a couple of headlines here that I rather like because they're good fun. <laughs> so so we, have, we have meltdown. A solar superstorm could send us back to the dark ages and one is due in just three years. Okay, so that was from 2009. So the first thing to say is don't panic. We've obviously survived because we've got past 2012. <laughs> Well, my favourite, because every, every journalist needs a news peg, is the ones that went along this line. The next solar maximum is expected in 2012-13 and could coincide with the London Olympics. <laughs> my normal rule of thumb is when talking about space weather for about two years was just don't mention the Olympics because it made things a lot easier. But this was all because of, if we zoom in on the solar cycle over the last few solar cycles, so the last 50 years or so, so basically the space age, then um, you can see immediately at the right-hand end of this plot. That's where we are. This is what I downloaded today. So you can see at the moment we're, we're probably somewhere just past solar maximum. This is one of those things that's very hard to hit until you know that you've hit until you're, you're past it, and then you can look back and say, right, maximum. And actually, it looks like the current solar maximum is a bit of a damp squib. So that's the equivalent of a cold, wet summer. So... So activity seems to have been quite low this time. Um, and it may be that um, the space age, so the 50 years we've been able to fly things into the space environment and observe the sun free of the Earth's atmosphere by putting space-based solar telescopes above the atmosphere, it may actually be that we're coming out of the end of something called the grand solar maximum. It may be that the sun has just had a, a run of particularly uh, active maximum, a, a run of hot summers, if you like to think of it in, in regular meteorological terms and it's calming down a little bit now. And that will be something that time will tell. Although, as you can probably imagine, people who like to do statistical analysis on this can give you lots of different predictions of what you'll, will happen. Um, what I will do, though, is just, just put this movie up. I really do enjoy this movie, because this is just to show that, that, that space weather has an effect on things. It's not an abstract concept. Now, if you're an astronomer, this sort of um, effect it can have a very visible um, impact. So what we have here, and this is just a freeze frame of a movie I'm going to run in a moment, is uh, a little picture of something called Comet Enki. And so you can probably just make out Comet Enki, and I'll point it out with the laser pointer. Comet Enki is just up here with the head of the comet and its tail. And Comet Enki visits the sol inner solar system about every three years, and it's about five kilometers across, so it's pretty big um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the sort of things that we were hearing about in the news last week. Um, but on the grand scheme of things with planets and solar bodies, it's, it's not that big. And this was um, a movie uh, taken in 2007. It's actually, these are observations from a British-built instrument on board the NASA Stereo spacecraft. Um, and and the, the purpose of this instrument is actually not to look for comets. It's to look at the solar wind between the Earth and the Sun. So it's actually on a very interesting orbit, this spacecraft. It takes it out so it can view the, the space between the Earth and the Sun side on. And the idea is it's supposed to look at things that are coming from the Sun towards the Earth. Um, and what you'll see is when I set this movie running, 
is that the background star field, you can see lots of stars in the background, is moving because the spacecraft is in orbit around the sun. And this is a few days' worth of, uh, of, of measurement. But if you're very keen-eyed, what you might notice is at one point in the movie, the comet seems to shed its tail. And so at one point in the movie, this little tail actually disappears off. There it goes. In a really interesting way. And actually, if you watch it again, you soon realize that there is a vertical band which comes in and seems to knock the tail off. That's a region of enhanced density in the solar wind. So a process on the solar surface, or the, 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 the catching up of a region of slow solar wind being caught up by a region of fast solar wind coming on behind it and compressing and pushing along, has led to a little region where the density in the solar wind is a bit higher than usual. And so the density is higher, that means as it blasts past something, the pressure goes up. And so actually this is the pressure of the solar wind and magnetic fields induced inside the comet and in the solar wind actually snipping off the tail of the comet and taking it off into the interplanetary environment. Um, so that's one of the first ob direct observations of something visibly interacting in the space environment. This is space weather in action. Um, I always like to point out that no comets are harmed in the production of this movie. <laughs> As you can see, it, it grew a new comet very rapidly, a new tail very rapidly. So astronomers think space weather is very interesting. And also, there's a certain... Um, group of people who think it's very interesting because if you're going to do exciting and brave things in the space environment as an astronaut, then you really need to start thinking about the kind of radiation environment you're going to be flying through. And so here we obviously have one of the Apollo astronauts on the surface of the moon. Now, if you're going to travel to the, to the moon, the moon tends, tends to spend about a week of its, its monthly orbit inside the Earth's magnetosphere. So it sits under the Earth's magnetic shield, under our magnetic umbrella, if you like, shielded from the space environment for about a quarter of its orbit, something like that. However, for the rest of the time, it's outside, so you're in the solar wind. And during the Apollo era, there were quite a number of solar events, especially releasing bursts of very energetic protons. These are hydrogen nuclei with very high energies being fired out from the sun. And there were some alarming near misses, actually, where, where there were amounts of material released which had the Apollo astronauts been in space at the time, they would have received absolutely massive radiation doses. So most of them would have been in the areas which would make your eyes water when you think about the long-term health risks. Some of them probably would have made the astronauts ill and there was one which was of the order of the sort of fatal dose where they would have immediately been killed within hours. Um, but that wasn't really understood very well at the time and it was, it was good fortune that, uh, that the Apollo astronauts weren't affected by that. However, um, if you tend to fly to Mars, for example, then if you're going to fly to Mars, you're going to be outside the Earth's magnetic shield for six months at a time. And so it's entirely possible that you'll, you'll actually have to withstand several of these solar eruptions in terms of both the radiation from solar flares and actual explosions of solar material, coronal mass ejections, chucking out billions of tons of very hot, um, high-energy material into the space environment. And so... People who think about space missions are really thinking very hard about space weather. This particular spacecraft has skin in some parts that was almost like tin foil. It was very thin. And it's simply not practical to build spacecraft out of lead because it's rather heavy, and trying to get it to go fast means you need an improbably large rocket to do it. So there is some very clever engineering coming out of how you might protect astronauts from the, from, uh, the worst excesses of space weather. But also, um, scientists are very interested in, in space weather for other reasons, because Mars being our next-door neighbour should be broadly similar to the Earth. It's a bit further away from the Sun, so it's a bit cooler. Um, but you'd imagine it might look something like the Earth, especially when it was formed. You don't expect them to have been wildly different. However, you look at Mars now, and it clearly is wildly different from the Earth. And one of the reasons for that is probably that Mars is just a little bit too small. So beneath our feet in the core of the Earth, there is a, a core of iron and nickel which is churning around, and so currents in that, in that molten metal, electrical currents, will drive a strong magnetic field, will create a magnetic field, and that's the geodynamo that creates the magnetic field here on Earth. Well, on Mars, the core is a bit smaller, and actually most of the heat has escaped from Mars. The heat that was, that was left in Mars after it was formed has escaped. And this is, this is quite a familiar concept. If you tend to think about taking a hot cup of tea into the bathroom and running a hot bath, the hot cup of tea will cool down very quickly compared to the bath. And that's because the, if you look at the ratio of the surface area of your mug compared to the volume of the water in it, and look at the surface area of the bath compared to the volume of water in it, the bath is much more efficient at holding on to the, the, the heat. 
Well, in, this, in, in, in that analog, Mars is the mug of tea. It's gone cold quickly because it's got a large surface area for a relatively small volume, so the, the heat has escaped. And the, solid, the, the core at the center of Mars is frozen solid. So you now have a, a, probably a solid lump of iron and nickel at the center of Mars. There's no motion inside it. There's no convection due to thermal currents. And there's no electrical currents to drive a magnetic field. So Mars has lost its magnetic field. And it probably lost it quite soon after being formed, about 4 billion years ago. So at that point, Mars' atmosphere lost its magnetic force field. And it was left open to the solar wind. And the solar wind could actually come directly into contact with the atmosphere and then blast it off into the space environment. So Mars has actually lost most of its atmosphere through the sun blowing the solar wind and actually just taking the atmosphere off into interplanetary space. And even now, if you fly a spacecraft through the, the, the tail side of Mars, so the down, downwind uh, area of Mars, you can detect atmospheric particles from Mars being lost into the space environment. And so there are missions which are going to Mars in the next couple of years to study how climate change has had an impact on Mars that leaves it a dry, cold place compared to the Earth. And if you're really thinking ahead, if you're really wanting to see where human civilization might be in hundreds or thousands of years, or you're wanting to consider some of the really big questions of our universe, such as is there life elsewhere, then space weather is something you really need to think about. Because if life is to evolve on planets elsewhere in the universe, then it will probably need a relatively stable environment, something like the Earth. The Earth is pretty stable. Um, now, if it were to be like Mars, then perhaps life wouldn't evolve on a planet. And so that Earth-Mars analog immediately says that, well, the Earth has a magnetic field and the Earth's atmosphere is shielded from the space environment and the solar wind. So life has evolved on, on Earth because we have a nice thick atmosphere. And actually that thick atmosphere shields us from the radiation from the sun. So in the case of the Earth, we have a double, sort of a double layer defense system. The Earth's magnetic field shields the atmosphere from material leaving the sun. The atmosphere shields us from the radiation from the sun. So we require all those things for life to emerge. Poor Mars hasn't got those things. And actually, if we start thinking about life elsewhere in the universe, we're probably going to find, want to look on stars which are a bit like our own, relatively benign. We're probably going to look for, want to look for planets that have strong magnetic fields like our own. And one of the ways that astronomers are starting to pursue this is to think about if a planet has an atmosphere and a magnetic field, and it's a bit like the Earth, it will probably have aurora a bit like the Earth. So if you can spot either the visible or the radio emissions coming from aurora on extrasolar planets, then it's a telltale sign that that planet's got an atmosphere and a magnetic field. So it may actually come down to the fact that space-weather interactions will hold the key into finding life elsewhere in the universe. But that's very interesting. That's astronauts and astronomers. So you may still be unconvinced. You may still be thinking, I don't really need to think about space-weather very much. So what we'll do is we'll go back to our discussion that we started with, with James Van Allen, and the radiation belts. And so here is a cartoon of the radiation belts, the inner and outer radiation belts. And in cartoons such as this, they're drawn to be very neat things with very sharp edges. And in fact, they're a little bit more blurry. Sometimes the gap between the inner and outer belts is, is filled up. And sometimes the belts swell and expand. And sometimes they almost shrink away and die away completely. And that's driven by solar activity. Well, the interesting quirk of nature is, if you look at where the radiation belts are, and then you start to calculate which is the sweet spot in the space around the Earth where you'd want to put a geostationary satellite to make it hover above the same point on the ground. And actually, if I flip between those, even though these are in cartoon form, the scale is about right, you can see that geostationary orbit, which in this case is this ring around the Earth, is about where the radiation belts are. This is actually a schematic, a representation of the density of spacecraft in Earth orbit. And so each spacecraft is just shown by a, a little spot. They're actually little cartoon spacecraft. And obviously, they're not to scale, because if they were, each of those spacecraft would be the size of the Isle of Wight. Um, they're, in fact, you'd never see them. But, but uh, the distribution is, is, is physically correct. And so the geostationary satellites, which are in a 24-hour orbit around the Earth to perfectly coincide with the Earth's rotation rate, are sitting in about the part of space where the radiation belts like to do their thing. And when the radiation belts swell and expand and get filled up with very energetic material due to bad space weather, then this can impact on spacecraft operations. Um, and so spacecraft have been lost um, over the last couple of decades, almost certainly due to space weather. And the problems occur is that when you get very fast-moving electrons moving through the space environment, so subatomic electrically charged particles, 
they can build up on the surface of spacecraft and that builds up electrical charge and after a while that will break down and, and we'll get a spark forming to discharge parts, one part of the spacecraft relative to the other. And sparks aren't very good for sensitive electronics. Also, you can have, these electrons can be moving so fast, they can move directly through solid state devices, silicon chips. And so you have a little bit of electrical charge moving through and sometimes deposited in a silicon chip. Well, that basically, if you have a bit of charge in a silicon chip, that converts a binary zero to a one somewhere, and that basically gives you a phantom command. Now, normally, your spacecraft can cope with that, and it will have error checking algorithms. But if it's very unlucky, it may be the one that does something very bad. And so spacecraft have been lost to what are thought to be space weather effects. Um, it's very difficult to tell because obviously you can't send someone up there to have a look and see what went wrong. Um, but but the, in terms of especially in, in post-event analysis, it looks like spacecraft are, are sensitive on occasions to, to space weather. Um, and of course, don't underestimate how many of these spacecraft you use in your daily life. Um, you may be thinking, I haven't got a skybox and I don't, um, I, I, I don't have sat-nav in my car, therefore I'll be okay. Um, the, when you start looking at what satellites control in, in your daily life, it's absolutely mind-boggling. Um, not only global media and communications, but defense, environment, communications, mapping. Even if you're not using the location services of, of satellites, other people that you rely on are, and the timing information. So it's incredibly important. And so this is a very big business, um, and so also there is a space insurance industry which ensures these satellites against loss, and they are also very interested in space weather because they want to know how to judge the risk in order to, to, to ensure and set the premiums appropriately for their spacecraft cover. And we also need to look ahead. We need to be thinking ahead and planning about things in low Earth orbit. So there's a similar kind of cartoon showing how near Earth space is full of low Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, not only satellites, bits of junk as well. So old dead satellites, astronauts, gloves, wrenches, bits of exploded, awful lots of stuff floating around in space. Um, and so typically, defense agencies would like to know where these things are because you want to be able to know, you want to know where things are in low Earth orbit that are moving very fast because you want to be sure that you don't think that they're an incoming intercontinental ballistic missile. And so when space weather is bad, what actually happens is the energy, path, the energy coming into the Earth's atmosphere increases and it warms up the atmosphere. And high school physics tells you if you warm up a gas, it starts to expand. And so the Earth's atmosphere expands. And so these spacecraft in low Earth orbit suddenly find themselves in a slightly denser, thicker atmosphere than they normally are in. And that increases the drag on the spacecraft and they slow down, which Newtonian mechanics then says will mean they'll go into a slightly lower orbit. And so sometimes these spacecraft aren't where they're supposed to be because the Earth's atmosphere has expanded and slowed them down. And so people lose track of them. And so there's just a little graph over here um, showing satellite tracking problems after uh, a storm in 1989. Um, and actually, the, the yellow trace is showing basically solar activity. So when it, goes, when it spikes up, that means solar activity and geomagnetic activity went up. And the little blue columns are showing the number of spacecraft that weren't where they were supposed to be. And as you can see, as the solar activity went up and geomagnetic activity went up, the number of spacecraft that weren't quite where they were supposed to be um, to, goes up. And generally, when this sort, of things happen, this sort of thing happens, defense agencies tend to go on a higher state of alert because they want to make sure they know where everything is. But there is also the problem that if, if unchecked, then the decay of a satellite orbit into a slightly lower orbit will, will put it into a thicker atmosphere, which will cause it to slow down, which will cause it to fall into a lower orbit where the atmosphere is thicker, it will slow down further. And the drag eventually just kills all the velocity and it, it drops out of the sky. Now, normally that isn't a problem. These things don't normally make it through the atmosphere. But um, what can happen is you can have spacecraft re-entering earlier than planned. Um, and you can have spacecraft actually being put on collision course. And so the little cartoon on the bottom right, the schematic there, is, um, an anima is just a graphic showing the motion of some spacecraft um, after collision. So this, um, I'll use the pointer, the big, the big pink trace here is one satellite. Uh, it's a Cosmos satellite, and it was an old satellite, an old Russian satellite. And this was the orbit of an Iridium satellite, the kind of satellite that would give you um, satellite mobile phone coverage if you're in the Arctic. Um, and actually, these two satellites collided. Um, and, and that was bad news, because not only do you lose those two satellites, which are incredibly valuable, and the people relying on the services lose them, so there's an enorm enormous immediate financial loss to that. But there is also then the problem that you've created thousands, tens, or hundreds of thousands of bits of small debris, which each go into their own orbits. And so this is what you call a debris tube now of these two satellites. 
And it's a problem because other satellites now cross this debris tube and it's filling up as this cloud spreads out with junk. And each of those bits of junk will then start to be affected by space weather as the atmosphere expands and contracts and will start to spread out into different orbits. So this is, this is really bad news for, um, for satellite operators. They really have to think very carefully about how to avoid this kind of thing. So perhaps I'm going some way to saying that, that there is an obvious economic and societal impact to this kind of stuff that we probably should be thinking about how to plan for in the future. We do need a bit of foresight when we're considering space weather. And so it's as I start to talk about that foresight, I'm immediately going to take us back 150 years um, and mention the Carrington event, which was mentioned in the introduction. So about 150 years ago, 1859, a British astronomer, Richard Carrington, um, a gentleman astronomer, was making observations of the sun. And this is actually an extract from the monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society. We're, and uh, what we see in the bottom part of this, uh, of this, this paper is one of his beautiful hand-drawn sunspot diagrams. So he had a helioscope in his observatory at home and he was reproducing the sunspots he could observe. And whilst he was doing this, the room brightened. And he had originally assumed that someone had come in and opened the blind. He then realised that the light was coming through his helioscope, through his telescope. And he happened to just be pointing at the right part of the sun at exactly the right moment to catch a, a, a flare going off. So the sun flared and the output of the sun went up dramatically in a few seconds and the room brightened. And he was so amazed, he actually went and ran off to get, I think he was went to get the housekeeper, the only other people, the person in the house, to come and show her this incredible phenomenon he'd observed. And by the time he'd found her and come back to his helioscope, it had basically died away again. So there's a, there's a lesson there for all observational um, scientists in that you should keep with your observations because you know, don't leave them. But that was in, in itself, that was a remarkable thing. And actually, it, was, it must have been an enormous flare. For him to see that, it must have been about the biggest white light flare on record. Um, we don't have some of the modern measures. It's difficult to make a comparison because of, of changes in the techniques, but it was certainly a very big event. And what was interesting was, um, well, what was interesting was that a few minutes later, uh, the, the magnetometer, so the, the magnetic field sensing instrument, which was at Kew Observatory, became disturbed moments after a solar flare, or nine, about nine minutes after the solar flare. And so actually we have on the, on the left-hand side of this, this is actually the, uh, the magnetic field traces. Uh, I think they're on photographic paper um, to, to create, to, to record these. And nine minutes after the solar flare, the magnetic field of the Earth wobbled. And that was due to radiation coming from the sun. The X-rays arrived at the Earth and they actually ionized the upper atmosphere. They, they broke apart the, the material in the upper atmosphere and allowed electrical currents to flow a little bit more easily through the solar atmosphere, through the Earth's atmosphere. And when electrical currents can flow, they, they generate their own magnetic field, and that was superimposed on the Earth's field, and it was detected as a wobble in the Earth's field. But more interestingly, about 20 hours later, magnetometers worldwide went absolutely crazy. They went off the charts. And this was probably one of the, the, the first real space weather event of the modern times. So this was a, a Victorian space weather event. And um, although a, space weather, a solar terrestrial connection would, had been postulated previously, this was starting to look like the smoking gun. The sun did something you could see, and about a day later, the Earth responded. Um, and, and everyone responded. I have here, there are three, um, three newspaper articles there, and we're not going to go through them all. But three newspaper articles from the United States of, from the time, people talking in the top one about the, uh, the, the, the sky being blood red over the streets of San Francisco. Uh, in the middle story, um, I love this one, um, it was obviously, it was, the, the aurora must have been very bright because birds were rising from the trees at two in the morning, giving these New Orleans gentlemen the opportunity to shoot them with shotguns. And uh, on the bottom one, we travelers in the Rocky Mountains who were observing aurora so bright you could read by it. And it was so bright that people who were used to living outdoors thought it was breakfast time and time to get up and start, start to eat, that the sun was coming up. The aurora, and the aurora reported it down in the Caribbean, they were reported in Cuba, quite close to the equator according to ship's captain. So the aurora were observed all over the world, night after night for about three or four days. So this was a big space weather event and certainly anyone alive at the time under a cloud-free sky would have seen something on one of those nights. But this is about the first instance we have of space weather interacting with technology. And so we're going to look at the Victorian internet. We're looking at the telegraph system here. And I have here a conversation which was taken, uh, which was which between um, two telegraph operators on the Boston to Portland um, line. And it gives you an idea of the effect that the Aurora Borealis had on technology at the time. 
So, of course, it being a telegraph, we can, we can see what the, what the conversation was even now. So then, we have to pay attention here. So the Boston operator said to the Portland operator, So you all read Morse. <laughs> oh, OK. Fortunately, in the clear, it looks like, please cut off your battery entirely from the line for 15 minutes. And the Portland operator replies, we'll do so. It's now disconnected. So these guys, have had to, they've had terrible interference on their, their telegraph line. And so they've both unplugged their telegraph sets from the power supplies. And yet, they're still talking. So the Boston operator says, mine is disconnected, and we're working with the auroral current. How do you receive my writing? To which he gets the reply, better than with our batteries on. <laughs> current comes and goes. So currents in the upper atmosphere are being induced into the copper lines and powerful enough for them to work the telegraph system without any external power supply. And so a conversation then goes on, basically saying, well, my current is very strong at times, and we can work better without the batteries, as the aurora seems to neutralize and augment our batteries alternately, making current too strong at times for our relay magnets. So he's basically saying, sometimes the current's going away, the way we're trying to drive it with our batteries, and sometimes it's going the same way, making it too strong. Let's just work without, shall we? Suppose we work without batteries while we're affected by this trouble. Very well. Shall I go ahead with business? Yes, go ahead. And off they go. And they carry on working without any power supply for several hours. In other parts of the world, though, operators were electrocuted, not killed. There's no records of being killed, but were, were injured. And, and telegraph stations burnt to the ground due to electrical fires started by this current. So tremendous currents being generated in long, long lines. But at the time, I mean, I'm based in Lancaster. So up in the northwest, this was the, the, the state-of-the-art transport system. It was made of iron and steel and, and, coal, and powered by coal and steam and required oil and sweat to make it go. And, and it was pretty bomb-proof in terms of space weather. There was nothing on there that was going to be vulnerable to space weather. But of course, if we fast forward to today, we're now in a, system, in, in, a, in a technological age where we have systems where computers are embedded in virtually every aspect of every system. We rely on electricity for virtually every, every, every system on board this transport device. Other train operators are obviously available. Um, signaling, so, so there are instances of um, electrical currents being induced in the power lines and in the signal lines which can affect the signaling. So in the last 100 years, that's been a, a, a known phenomenon. And this applies to any long conducting network. If you have a long pipeline, it will start to corrode faster because of currents flowing through the long pipeline in the same way that you have sacrificial anodes on the hulls of ships to stop them corroding because of electrical uh, currents flowing through the hull. You need to start thinking about how it's going to affect your pipeline. So there's lots of very interesting effects that space weather can drive. And actually, you might think that we're becoming more and more aware of the risk and therefore uh, the, the risk should be dropping off. Whereas in fact, in reality, the risk has only just started because we're only just now getting to the point where our technologies are completely dependent, we're completely dependent on our technologies and they are embedded with, with computers um, to, to a, um, a massive extent. And so even if you think about the sleek high-tech jet on the top left compared to the, the modern passenger airline, it's all wires and hydraulic systems, the aircraft on the top left. It's very impressive, but it's quite low. It's, it's old technology. Whereas the aircraft on the right, as in any other aircraft of its, of its generation, has an awful lot of computers on board. There are no wires between the command system and the, and the control surfaces. They're actually computers talk to each other. And so you want to make sure that all the computers are radiation hard. You want to make sure that there's nothing inter nothing's going to interfere with them. And then, of course, there's other aspects. If you're going to travel from Chicago to Hong Kong, certainly since the end of the Cold War, an airline nowadays would go over the polar route because it's the quickest route. But if we keep in mind where we see the aurora, it's in these polar areas because that's where the Earth's magnetic field comes down to the magnetic pole. And so this is actually an area which is where, where for a start, the ionosphere is very disturbed. So radio communications can be a problem when space weather is bad, which means that an aircraft might not be able to take that route. It might have to take a longer route because it wants to maintain good communications with the ground. And obviously, that means the aircraft's going to take longer to get there. It's going to use more fuel. It might be able to carry less luggage. It's going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's going to be lots of very grumpy passengers. So this has a real economic impact. And there are safety aspects. You know, the squishy things that ride inside those metal tubes, we're above most of the atmosphere when we're in an aircraft like this. And so if there's an increased radiation dosage from space, then the aircraft will either have to fly at a lower altitude, in which case there'll be more drag and it will take more fuel, or it'll have to divert to a lower latitude route where there's also a fuel implication as well. So there's lots of issues around travel and technology 
that are starting to really think and look ahead and think, how are we going to plan for space weather? Power systems, well, we think about the instance with those long copper lines for the telegraph line. Power systems, um, potentially, um, are vulnerable to disturbances in space weather because they drive, the disturbances in the space environment drive electrical currents through the ground, which like to close through these, the transformers and through these long lines. And so you can have um, some quite large currents put through these lines which can interfere with the operation of the transformers at either end. And there has been some talk recently about what might happen in the worst case scenario, what would happen if, if a lot of transformers were damaged all at once. And some of the worst case scenarios go a bit like this. They say that much of the grid might collapse because you might damage 50% of the transformers across the UK or Europe or the US in one night and you don't have the capacity to replace them all, except on the time scale of months to years. And so you start to have these sort of nightmare scenarios that look a little bit like power lines go down, which lead to blackouts, which are annoying at first, but after some time you stop being able to pump fuel into your car or into the lorries that deliver the food to your just in, in the just-in-time delivery system into your supermarket, so the supermarket shelves start to empty and the water processing plants are not able to operate after about a week or so they might run out of diesel, of, 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 uh, diesel backup power and the same would go for refrigeration of food and drugs and would emergency services be able to cope if power went down for, for example, a month? Most, most probably don't plan for that kind of time scale. And those are the, 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 the zombie apocalypse doomsday scenarios that you sometimes see coming out of it and which tend, generally do tend to grab the media. If you tend to look at it in a little bit more of a sane way, you can start to put on some of the cost implications of some of these, because if you want to work out whether it's worth taking steps to mitigate against this, then actually looking at the cost argument is one of the ways to actually leverage that, uh, that change in, in, in policy. And so there was a study done by NASA a couple of years ago that suggests that, that, uh, that a, a, a Carrington event like um, disturbance would probably cost the US about one to two trillion dollars in the first year, and it would take them between four to 10 years to recover. Um, key thinkers in the field suspect this is probably a very worst case scenario, um, but nevertheless, they are big numbers. So it is worth planning for and having some foresight looking ahead at space weather. How are we gonna plan and mitigate some of these problems? Your foresight though may be to buy a book from Amazon. <laughs> so solar flare survival um, is, is quite a good fun one. It tells you how to build a Faraday cage um, and protect yourself from the sun's environment. I do like some of the newspaper headlines. Um, you could also buy yourself a little bolt hole. So this is a story in the newspaper. So you might, have, you might say this is one form of foresight. In fact, this, is a, this refers to a converted ICBM silo in Kansas, which has been fitted out as a luxury bolt hole, and you could have bought an apartment there, and they even have HD cameras so you can see what's going on the outside world. So you can watch the zombie apocalypse from the comfort of your swimming pool. But I don't really think that's very good foresight. I think real foresight is looking at how to deal with these risks. And they're high impact, low frequency events. And so they actually fall into exactly the same kind of category as things like volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunami, pandemic illnesses. They're events which are probably unlikely to happen. But if they happened, could have an enormous impact. Sometimes these are called black swan events. And so, I hope you'll be heartened to see that scientists in the UK have been working with the UK government to make sure that space weather is included in the National Risk Register of Civil Emergencies. So the way that you usually deal with these things is you create what they call a, this matrix system where on one axis you have the likelihood of something happening and on the other one you have the overall impact if it happens. And so um, space weather, if I can just find it, is somewhere in here. So, so space weather is in the kind of category of sort of heat waves and things like that where probably not going to be a massive problem in the UK, but if they did happen, a lot of people could be affected um, with, some quite, with some quite serious impact. And so the governments go away and think about this quite a lot, talking to scientists. You'll also be pleased to learn it's actually in the UK's national security strategy. If you download that from the government's website and type space weather in, you'll find what the government's strategic response to space weather in terms of defence is. And also, it was one of the case studies used in a recent uh, select committee, government, uh, House of Commons Select Committee, uh, inquiry into how to take scientific advice um, in emergencies. And this came out of the volcanic ash cloud from the Icelandic, Icelandic volcano. And it was clear that the evidence that the scientists had wasn't really feeding into the policymakers about what could fly and where. Uh, 
And so actually space weather, volcanic ash clouds, and I think pandemic flu, uh, bird flu, was, uh, was, was one of the case studies they looked at, at how the government could take advice from scientists. And so as I kind of start meandering towards a, towards a close, what I would say is that the modern day equivalents of Van Allen are, are out there working very hard to understand the basic physics of space weather. And so what we have here, for example, are on the left, you see the Earth rotating around there as it goes around from the day to night cycle. Those little spots with little flags coming out look like wind socks. They're actually electrical currents flowing in the upper atmosphere measured from a network of a few hundred ground stations, that one in the northern hemisphere. And on the right, this is uh, measurements of the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere, being set in motion by electric currents and uh, driven in from the solar wind and in through the magnetosphere. And we're looking at how the, uh, we're using radars to measure how the atmosphere responds to space weather drivers. Of course, the issue is, is that you've got a few hundred space weather stations on the ground compared to about 15,000 meteorological weather stations. You then have the other whammy that the Earth's atmosphere is about 200,000 times smaller than the magnetosphere. So what we're trying to do, if you put it in meteorological terms, is we're trying to predict the global weather using two thermometers, one in New York and one in Canberra. <laughs> we don't quite have enough measurements yet, so we're getting there. It's a relatively new science. So even if you try and fill space with spacecraft, this is the Van Allen probes being launched by NASA last year. You know, there are probably about a dozen spacecraft in the space environment carrying out fundamental research into the space environment, where there's about 1,300 balloons released every day to sample in situ measurements in the Earth's atmosphere to create those weather forecasts that we get. So at the moment, we're still in a rather data, data poor environment. But we're getting there. And so one of the ways that that's happening is this is the Van Allen probes launched last summer by NASA, designed specifically, this is their return to the radiation belts, to study the physical processes that are accelerating process it, uh, particles in the radiation belts. But all these things are great, but what we actually are aiming towards is this kind of thing. What we're trying to do is create models. We're trying to foresee and forecast space weather. And so we need a model which will look at the, Earth, the sun's magnetic field, look at then how that fits into the, Earth's, the sun's atmosphere, model how that, any disturbances move out through the space environment, model then how that impacts on the Earth's magnetosphere, and then look at how the magnetosphere then transmits that energy down into the ionosphere and the atmosphere. So we're trying to build models based on our data and our physics, which will enable us to forecast space weather. And so the top animation is actually an event from uh, last January where the sun emitted a coronal mass ejection, a billion tons of plasma heading earthwards at about 1,000 kilometers per second. And you can actually, we're actually looking down on the sun. Um, and it, as it turns around, it fires material out like a garden sprinkler. And the Earth is actually one of those little dots. It's actually the uh, little yellow one here. And so you're able to predict when this will arrive at the Earth. So your satellite operators and your grid operators are all able to get their systems running in safe mode. And you're able to operationally protect the system. So part of the challenge of this, of, this, of, of trying to take this foresight and do something useful with it, is how it then fits in with the engineering. And you might have even heard, if you listen to the Today program or you watch, the, you watch the, the evening news, you might have heard that the Royal Academy of Engineering only last week released their report on extreme space weather, how to look at the impacts on engineering, engineered systems. So what they're trying to think is, if you've got an event like the Carrington event, which probably occurs about once every 100 years, how do you build that into your procurement for your transformers for the power grid? How do you build that into the operation of your satellite so you know to operate in a safe mode and not to launch new satellites into bad space weather? You wait until things have got better. How do you actually make your system better to begin with and then operate it sensibly with the best advice from scientists in the forecast? And so it's really all about taking um, the best understanding we have and applying that to give us foresight. And I did look up a couple of definitions of foresight before I gave this lecture. And one of them I came across was the ability to predict or plan for the future. And the other one would be provision for or insight into future problems. And it's exactly this kind of thing which is going to help us in terms of giving us engineering solutions to the increased risk that's come about simply because we're changing our society. So the sun's the same as it's always been. The earth's pretty much the same as it's always been. It's just those clever little folks on the ground building systems that are vulnerable to space weather, which means we have to have this foresight looking ahead. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, very much indeed, Jim, for a really fantastic look into space weather and to showing us what it might hold for us here on Earth and on other planets. Clearly, our society is completely dependent uh, and yet threatened by the sun. We need it, after all, for, for warmth and light and sustenance. And uh, even Galileo knew, knew that. And if we quote him again, he said, uh, wine is sunlight held together by water. And in terms of weather forecasting, of course, you know, you think about Michael Fish. Uh, is there a space hurricane on the way? Perhaps we shouldn't follow Michael Fish. Perhaps our answer should be, well, if you're watching, do worry, there is. But I think it sounds as though we're going to be quite safe. There's time for dinner tonight and that we certainly won't taste the solar wind. And ultimately, we will continue to have some lovely aurora to, to look at. So, Jim, thank you very, very much indeed for a really splendid lecture.